Welcome back to Highly Respected. I'm your host, Scott Greer. We've got another terrific superlative episode today for you guys. I know you guys were once again expecting, it's like, oh, he's going to say that this one is a mediocre episode. And then, boom, no, you're wrong. It's actually an, another incredible episode of Highly Respected today. So we have a universal topic or a theme today that even goes through to the cognitive elite question. I mean, this isn't uh, necessarily on purpose that we chose this cognitive elite question. It's just the way it happens, just the way that the cookie crumbles uh, today. And it is uh, it's over a very uh, uh, pressing issue of cancel culture and, and censorship. I know we've talked about this before, but there are a bunch of latest events that all tie together into this. And there's little snippets to... Uh, discussed in three different cases um, that I wanted to talk about first, and then we'll get to the cognitive elite question that also deals with it. And so you get to cover a wide ground on this topic with what we see. And all these events are from last week <clears throat> in, various, in various ways we see it. Actually, it'll be even like four cases of this. Um, but you know, we're not going to, we're not going to be counting. We're not going to, no math involved in this. There may be more than four cases that we discuss before we get to the cognitive elite question. But the first one we're obviously going to talk about is none other than Joe Rogan and what's happening with Joe Rogan. <clears throat> first off, when people first looked at the Joe Rogan case and what was happening to them, to him. At first, people were like, oh, man, he's defeating cancel culture because Spotify was having all this pressure on them to censor uh, Joe Rogan's misinformation about COVID. They're like, oh, we got to get rid of him. Neil Young came out as like, you you can either choose my music or you can choose <laughs> you can choose Joe Rogan. And they chose Joe Rogan and they removed uh, Neil Young's music. Then there was a bunch of other artists that came out. Um, <laughs> Some of these aren't even really big. The funniest was Mary L. Trump, uh, Trump's uh, insanely narcissistic, horrible niece who's been making a name for herself uh, off the Trump brand. I think the funniest thing about Mary L. Trump is that when she released her book, she put in PhD in her author title, which is just showing how um, a narcissist this person is and how self-inflated is that. One of the reasons that I put in 62187 IQ is... Uh, in my, in my title on Twitter is that there were all these people who I, I attacked AOC for something or criticized her for something. And then I was getting all these people who had Esquire or JD or MD or PhD attacking me in this. And then like I did a joke, I had like J, uh, PhD, MD, Esquire, on there and people actually believe that and then i was like and then i put six two and that's really what made people upset and then i just decided to simplify that and put my real uh credentials of six two one eighty seven on there but all these people would love to put their credentials on there is a big red flag to so to speak but that is a one of the one of highly respected uh favorite digressions to just talk about but Hang on. So all these people are like threatening to leave Spotify, but Spotify is sticking with Joe Rogan. They're like, ah, whatever, you know, we'll 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 put a covid content warning on our on our shows that we think are spreading uh, covid stuff. And then like, OK, this is over. And then conservatives are like, Woo-hoo! C- cancel culture is on the retreat. We're, we're done. Wokeness is done. Uh, they're really suffering. They're in massive retreat. You know, this is like uh <laughs> A, ma- a major battle like the wa- oh, this is wokeness's waterloo and they're fleeing they're fleeing and 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 uh, the intellectual dark web is in hot pursuit of these people even though a lot of the intellectual dark web people are are huge covid uh mandate lovers so i don't know if they would necessarily like uh, joe rogan but that's what they were talking about and then it merged this video which i had seen like many years before it's it's an old video of Joe Rogan saying the N word like several times on a show, and it's like two minutes long. It's, and somebody re uh, you know reshared it on Twitter and went viral, and now this is what's really uh, hurting uh, Joe Rogan. And there was actually a tweet that saying um, you know Second City Bearcat, who we'll mention two times in this podcast. So this will be the first. You'll have to wait for the second time we'll mention him. Is that he, you know, had a funny tweet where he's like, Will Joe Rogan saying the word of power get him canceled? And 
This is having a bigger effect than his uh, quote unquote misinformation he was spreading or really the guests he was having on who were talking about this is this is that he, you know, he didn't really issue an apology for, you know, the what his guests like Robert Malone and others were saying. He didn't say that, he, you know, he kind of just moved on from it, you know, accepted the COVID content um, advisory or whatever that they're going to have putting on there. And but when the um, N word thing came out, he said, this is the most shameful thing I've ever done. And I'm so uh, I'm so sorry for this. It's not my word. White people can't say this. I'm I'm terribly upset by this. Will you please forgive me? And, you know, Spotify is, you know, coming down a lot harder on him. You know, they released their CEO just released a letter saying that to to their employees saying like we're so hurt and upset by this and we didn't realize what we we're getting into but we've decided to continue his contract which they paid him a hundred million dollars for but we're going to use another hundred million dollars to uh invest in marginalized groups uh or, or marginalized artists whatever that means and that's what they're going through and throughout this scenario i can't help but think uh i think this was mike sermich who said this I'm pretty sure this is who said this, is that when Rogan signed this deal, I think it was in 2019 or so, somewhere around that time, and Sardimich said that, you know, this is a terrible idea. He's making all this money, but he's selling out. He's selling out his, uh, you know, his freedom and independence to have and, and to say what he wants and to have guests on whoever, whatever type of guests he wants, and he can allow them to say whatever they want. And he's going to give that up for a hundred million dollars. And sorry, much is right. Is that all this is down to Rogan selling out for money, which he did necessarily need. I mean, he was making a lot of money just through YouTube and he had total independence. You know, he wasn't, I mean, he, YouTube still had, you know, or wherever he had his platform, all were responsible for him, but less so than Spotify, which Spotify is like, you know, a paid exclusive podcaster for their for their platform you know he is a he is a spotify employee by all intents and purposes he's not independent and they make decisions over his content and this is what's happening now and they remove over roughly i think maybe an over 70 episodes of his podcast didn't give a reason why it's apparently that a lot of those episodes were the ones where he said the n-word or got into some other offensive discussion topic and so it's all gone now. And he has given up his artistic freedom and independence to for Spotify. And this is what's happening here. There's a lot to unpack here. A lot going on here that we need to discuss before uh, moving on on what Rogan's up to. Uh, first thing, I think this ridiculous notion that cancel culture is in retreat. People don't use this just with Rogan. They use this with a wide assortment of things. They'll see critical race theory bans going happening or people not getting canceled. I mean, they really upheld this Rogan example of that, like Spotify chose him over Neil Young and all these other artists who mainly aren't that important, such as uh, Mary L. Trump's uh, podcast that I'm sure no one was listening to, <laughs> uh, you know, that they're getting removed. I've actually been uh, removed from uh, spot. I actually removed my podcast from Spotify over uh, Rogan's misinformation. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I wonder if anybody will cover that. Um, but yeah, actually, Spotify said, you know, highly respected is not welcome on our on our platform. But maybe now they'll welcome me. We'll see. I don't think so. And going through what was happening with this is like conservatives are so desperate for some victories, and they do have some genuine wins. As, I mean, in the election in the election field and what the discourse is talking about and other things. But when it comes to cancel culture and like wokeness, it's like, you know, it's stronger than ever. And, James, you know, James Lindsay, who I don't know what the best, if you don't know who James Lindsay is, I'm trying to think of the way to describe him. He's, um, you know, an anti-wokeness crusader. He likes to play with a sword. He'll have these sword, weird sword fighting videos. And uh, he's really a goofball. But he's like always seen as like the center as one of the uh, lead experts on critical race theory for conservatives to go to, along with Chris Rufo. And he said that like I'm done with wokeness. Is like wokeness is finished, and I'm now going to focus on the right wing. <laughs> for some reason, I think he changed his mind. But you know, they really do think that that is like they've exposed wokenesses 
whole like um you know evil schemes and that there is no need more for to go after it and then we're just seeing the type of insanity that's going on i mean there's just like this example of a school that i did this joke is like wokeness is in retreat and they have these kids who are masked up they're like five years old there's kindergartners and they're walking around in a in a mock black lives matter protest with their own handmade signs uh calling about black lives matter and this is a DC private school, not necessarily the uh, best illustration of what's going on in America, but you know, it is what's happening. You know, a lot of these kids are going to be the elites of tomorrow and they're being raised to march around and, and declare Black Lives Matter. And, you know, that's like a sign that wokeness is not in retreat. Also, the fact that these schools are still uh, criminalizing kids for wearing masks. Uh, are, yeah, I mean, they are effectively criminalizing them because Loudoun County, which is a uh, suburb of D.C. out in Northern Virginia, you know, their their school system says that if kids come to school without masks and they've been told, you know, suspended or, uh, you know, otherwise reprimanded for it, they will be arrested for trespassing. And they're like threatening that they're going to send these like 13 year olds to jail for uh failing to wear a mask. And that's what Loudoun County is prepared to do. Other places in America are also doing this, but kids are revolting, which is like a white pill, I think, is that, especially in California, there was some school in California. I'm not, I think, I'm not quite sure where it was. I think it was maybe in Orange County, but don't uh, correct me. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but these kids were essentially locked into a gymnasium and they turned off the heat to freeze them and then they marched out in protest and were like we're tired of this we're tired of this crap and they're all refusing to wear masks and it's this is big time happening in Loudoun County as well and a couple of, and I think even in Fairfax County which is even more liberal than uh, Loudoun County Fairfax County is another uh, DC suburb in Northern Virginia so these are some of the things that are happening that are pretty exciting that are going on uh, throughout the country. But at the same time, we have to realize that, um, you know, wokeness is uh, about as strong as it's always been <laughs> right now. And it doesn't show much sign of, you know, of, of weakness at this moment. I, I mean, there are more and more people challenging it, but it's it's not so much getting challenged on the basis of just like people are fed up with this. People are fed up with this, but they put up with this. And there's also these types of power that are in, there to ensure that wokeness is enforced. First off, I guarantee that most of Spotify's employees are wanting to kick off Rogan. The only reason they don't, they don't is Spotify has made a $100 million investment in this. And they are worried that, you know, even though a lot of times, like all these companies, I always say like companies just don't give a shit about pissing off conservatives. Like they will do everything possible to alienate conservatives and conservatives will still uh, frequent platforms. Like conservatives will never threaten to boycott anything. We can see this throughout the NFL this year. I mean, conservatives actually attack people who demanded that they and like that this is right actually the cool position on the dissident right was to support the nfl and to continue watching it to own uh, uh people who say sports ball that's the sole reason and as you're watching an nfl game they all have like stop hate on their back of their like um uh, helmets and like end racism in the end zone and you're just like what the hell <laughs> there's like they played the black national anthem at marquee events and you're just like what the hell is going on here and conservatives still refuse to i'm still watching this shit and they will do this for any product they are is never i mean companies never have to worry about a backlash here but joe rogan's audience is not necessarily typical conservatives like you know there is a large audience he has a lot of them are not necessarily that political and they are drawn to spotify due to you know rogan being there and i think that they're already worried that they're losing liberals due to this and they're not going to game them back by firing because they're all going to say you waited too long this is a teachable moment spotify needs to you know put in more policies to ensure that this never happens again and they will piss off rogan's audience and many of the people who have you know signed up for Spotify solely for Rogan are going to leave with him. And Rogan could go anywhere he wants. I mean, Rogan will not be finished by Spotify canceling him. And they'll have to pay him a massive severance. I think that's another reason that they don't want to cancel him is that, you know, that's a lot of money that they have to pay off. And I think Spotify knows this won't satisfy 
either side in, in this matter. I mean, it may make the situation go away. I think they may end up, if there's like a new controversy with Rogan, I think they will end him. I, I think they'll end. It's, I can't, I don't know. It'd have to be a new thing. I think the end word, him talking about Planet of the Apes <laughs> and see, and saying it was like, it was like being surrounded by apes when the neighborhood he went to or he saw it in. I think those would be enough, but there's going to be something new. Or maybe there will be a new artist that they actually care about, like leaving. Maybe like an actual po popular pop artist that is still, uh, you know, maybe like Lady Gaga. Maybe Lady Gaga isn't the best example, but someone of that caliber who would get it and jump in and say, like, you're no longer going to have my music. And I think if more artists did that, they may do it over the, the racism uh, or the alleged racism of Rogan rather than his uh, quote unquote misinformation. Which I always will say this, that like accusations of racism are always uh, more powerful than anything else in our society. Um, and that's just the man, that's just the nature of the thing. And so this is what happening with uh, Rogan. And some people have argued about like whether Rogan is good or not. So I think there's always like people on our side who are all like, oh, this guy's a cuck. Like, good thing that we're getting rid of him. Maybe we'll replace him with somebody better, which like, no, you're not. And when it comes to Rogan, I'm mostly pro Rogan. I don't think he's not necessarily our guy or really into this stuff. But him being like kind of like an honest and or earnest, like open minded person who will just like have any type of converse, who is always wanting interesting conversations will allow new ideas to reach his massive audience that this audience would have never been exposed to. And so I'm very pro him in that. And he just like has frank conversations. I think like being someone into the Joe Rogan show, it is a sign, you know, there is a certain reputation that comes along with that and a sign of what you are, but that it is also a sign that you're getting introduced to much better ideas than you would be if you're listening to like the New York Times podcast or NPR, you are getting much better information and I think many more red pills, so to speak, than you would from any other very popular podcast. So in general, I'm pro uh, Rogan. I know he's got a lot of goofy aspects about him. He's not really our guy. Um, but I think it's just the fact that he's willing to host a lot of different people who will say interesting things on his podcast and introduce his massive audience to new ideas. That's a good thing about him. And so I don't want him uh, necessarily uh, canceled, so to uh, this thing. But it's this is all gets back to why they. I think this mainly started over. You know, it started over like him having Malone and stuff. But what really ex accelerated this was him having Jordan Peterson on. And Jordan Peterson wore a tux tuxedo for some reason on the podcast. And Peterson, they went in and said Michael Eric Dyson, some famous black academic, is not really black. <laughs> and only and Rogan said that you can only be black if you're like 100% uh, black from Africa <laughs> uh, from this thing. And then they went into like how climate change, you know, they is they had they were skeptical of climate change and on other numerous factors. And just this podcast was such a just like a huge uh, f you to his haters that they were gonna definitely go after him even more. So I, and I feel like Rogan has been beaten by this whole. Uh, episode that he is not going to want to challenge them again and he's going to be having much more boring podcasts going forward in order, in order to preserve his contract but we'll see I, I feel like this controversy is not going to go away and I feel there's going to be maybe this month maybe a month from now there's going to be some new controversial point uh, brought up about Rogan and that will be the end of his relationship with Spotify but I think it'd almost be better for him I am not I'm not the first in saying this I don't I think this would be better for him to for him to get canceled by Spotify because that would make him a martyr and make him even more of a hero and then it, he has such a massive audience that he can go wherever he wants and wherever whatever platform decides to snap him up or allow him to host will you know receive a ton of goodwill and he can go like I said, he can go wherever he wants. And, you know, he's he's an independent guy. He's got millions of dollars already. He's a huge, He's he's got major star power. And that's what he's going to go for. 
with, um, you know, if he got canceled. So I think it'd be better for him if he, you know, instead of being cucked and, you know, having to follow Spotify stricter rules and continuing to apologize and be on his knees, it'd be much better if he just got fired and he was allowed to do his own thing again. So now moving on to the next subject, which may be one or two different things that deal with uh, censorship and cancel culture. And this is happening right now, is that one of the funny things about the Rogan thing is that everyone debating he be censored and taken down were all up in arms for at least a week or two weeks over a local school in a rural county in Tennessee uh, dropping Mouse, uh, which is this Holocaust-themed graphic novel where uh, you, there, the animals, it's like with animals in the Holocaust, it's like the cats are Nazis and the mice are, are Jews and whatever. I haven't read it. I, I don't plan on reading it at any time. But they, uh, this local, McMinn County, which is, it's like a very poor uh, eastern Tennessee county. Actually, I didn't even know. I saw like the nearest town to it. I was like, wow, that's really rural. And it's uh, the uh, average income there is significantly lower than the average income anywhere else. But the fact that they're no longer going to have this a part of their middle school curriculum, they're not even banning the book. They just simply dropped it, served as two weeks of... People believing that banned books are real, conservative cancel culture is real. This is so terrible what they're doing, and that uh, the it, they imagine that like the entire t state of Tennessee is now banning kids learning about the Holocaust or whatever, which is not the case at all uh, with this book. They simply drop the book from its curriculum, and now some people are pointing out like, well, this is pretty it's pretty hypocritical for all these people to say that. You know that it's a major outrage that this this school, you know, dropped mouse from its curriculum, but now all these same people are demanding that Spotify drop uh, Joe Rogan from the podcast, and of course that uh, led to liberals immediately turning magically turning into reason esque libertarian saying this is a private company they could do whatever they want they could do whatever they want and but it's like you know Spotify deleting those seventy episodes I think that Rogan, all of his episodes have been taking off YouTube and all other platforms. Like the only way you can listen to Rogan, like even those old episodes is to go to Spotify. And now there's no way to listen to those 70 episodes, which, you know, with mouse, like a kid could just go to his library and get the book or make sure to go to any bookseller to get it. And also there was like booksellers who were like essentially sending the entire county of McMinn, the uh, McMinn County, a copy of mouse. So there's like very hard for them to not uh, get a hold of this book. And it's the same with even banned books. And even they're talking about like, you know, some schools have removed, uh, you know, pornographic or, or work, uh, books that they feel that are inappropriate for children for their libraries. And like, this is a major ban. They can no longer get a hold of this. It's like, they can go to their nearest bookstore or go to Amazon and easily get these books. Like now you can't get like a Rogan podcast from, you know, it's very hard to get it. It's like, this is the difference between Texas and Strip. And it's also like, these same people have been urging Amazon to ban books. So it's like, it's much harder for you to get a copy of you know ryan anderson's when harry met sally than it would be mouse but nobody cares about um you know the censorship that's happened in that book that book's about uh, gender ideology and trans stuff and it's been censored by amazon and a couple of other places and there's it's like several other books that have been an example of that i mean any you know amazon has gone through all these books that they allege to be racist and they've taken them off actually i am a victim of a book banning campaign is that um i didn't even realize this until like last year but for some reason there was a I think it was the in like Ottawa. Actually, it's like uh, the Ottawa or Toronto public libraries in Canada. There was this campaign to ban my book, which I didn't even know about at the time. I mean, my publisher was terrible about alerting me to this news events, but I think it was like a year after my book had been published. I think this occurred in like 2018. So I was like no longer promoting my book anymore, and I was like, uh, you know, I was like moved on to different things. And there was this massive campaign that there's, I don't know if massive, but there was a push to ban my book from the libraries. 
and uh, Toronto or Ottawa or whatever the library was stood up for my book and said like, no, we'll, we'll allow it to be there. And, you know, it was a major victory for free speech that I just didn't find out until like three years after the fact. But, you know, I was like a victim of this. Uh, you know, that's a legitimate, um, you know, book banning campaign that would happen much more so than what's happened to mouse. I mean, and you know, what in the libraries that are happening, you know, those are where actual people who make decisions in society live and elites live. And like those books and, you know, those libraries uh, offer access to way more people than the Mc, Mc, McMinn County middle school system. <laughs> um, you know, I don't I, I would not be surprised that there's only one or two middle schools in that county, depending on how small it is. But there is this major reaction towards it. Um, and at, you know, just a few days later, they go or really at the same exact time as they're complaining about this school, supposedly banning the book, which they did not do. They just dropped it from its curriculum or its middle school curriculum, rather, and them having a whole week long meltdown over it. And at the same time, they're demanding Spotify remove Joe Rogan for, you know, his guests saying things that uh, contradict uh, progressive orthodoxy and, you know. You know, a little bit of hypocrisy, even though people are tired of pointing out hypocrisy. I mean, it is something interesting to note that this is the push that they have and the type of arguments that they that they use regularly. And so they don't see any they don't see any hypocrisy in it because they just revert to a libertarian position, which they don't hold at any point in time when it comes to enforcing the Civil Rights Act or say a private business deciding to censor gay works or gay books and or LGBT um, works, you know, they would not have the same opinion as they do with Spotify censoring Joe Rogan. And they're also ignoring the fact that, you know, Joe Rogan is being censored, not necessarily at the behest of customers or our boycott. It's being censored in part at the behest of the government. You know, the, you know, anytime they ask Jen Psaki about this stuff or even Joe Biden, they demand that tech companies censor and take these people off and that they follow their guidelines. And even the White House has said, we've been working with big tech to, for them to censor hate speech and misinformation. And it's like, um, you know, that doesn't sound like the free market at work. You know, that sounds a little bit like government uh, intervening to censor private opinions and the opinions of its citizens. But, you know, none of this really matters. I mean, you know, people, it is still interesting to call out, to note the hypocrisy. I think a, a, some people, you know, we're, it's so common for us to do this on the right because there's so much uh, hypocrisy is that there is a subsection of our fan base who will just get mad if you ever point out hypocrisy at all. They're like, like, how dare you? It's time to do action. Why are you not calling for serious action here? Stop saying hypocrisy or just like, and they'll like have some memes about this. They'll get mad at any time you point this out. Uh, but, you know, it is what it is. You just have to note it. Um I don't, it does not affect liberals. So you're not like putting out hypocrisy is not necessarily affecting liberals, but it does illustrate the insanity of the current moment to our own side. No, we're not going to persuade the the liberals of their own hypocrisy because they don't feel that there's any hypocrisy here. They feel that you know you have to read the books that they demand children to read. The you know to do that is a threat to democracy, but to uh, you know, challenge what our health experts and Dr. Fauci are doing is also a threat to democracy because all this is a part of the big threat to democracy that I've talked about. And that's how they rationalize this. And they're not going to be convinced of this in any other matter. Um, that goes to another point that even though Jordan Peterson is largely responsible for, uh, I wouldn't say largely responsible, but partially responsible for what's happened to Joe Rogan, he still thinks that the best ideas can win in the marketplace because he was arguing, he had a tweet arguing against uh, critical race theory bans. And this echoes some other people like Andrew Sullivan who are saying that kids should learn everything, like actual every author that like they're assigned like a thousand authors and they're just supposed to make up their minds about which like a lot of people know how insane that is. Uh, no kid's going to do that. So the sensible approach is either to teach them critical race theory or to ban it outright. There is no gooey middle ground here where we, we're a free marketplace in this classroom. No, these kids, kids don't even want to learn what they already are supposed to learn. They don't want to have to read a thousand books to make them decide what their opinion on critical race theory is. This is complete fantasy. But with better ideas winning out, I mean, this is already... 
uh, as we're seeing with like Rogan and, and several all these censorship cases, um, it's really just who has power is winning out, not who has the best ideas is winning out. And it's just like a stupid appeal that no one has ever followed f before at any point in history. And, you know, if you're thinking that this is a harmful idea and that it's being paid for by taxpayers as the only idea as indoctrination for these kids that has no educational value, you just simply eliminate it. No, you no need to just like present other ideas. This isn't like evolution or, or some, you know, scientific theories that are, you know, still, you know, cause controversy. There is no educational value to learning about critical race theory. You just ban it. Like, it's like, you're not going to teach, like, white self-hatred to kids. Sorry. That's what, that's the only solution to it. And Peterson just loves to say these types of things to look above it all or be a firm commitment to anti-censorship. But this is just, like, uh, letting liberals outmaneuver them on the censorship debate where liberals who are busy censoring everyone and ensuring that you can't even obtain certain podcasts and books and ideas or articles are then pretending that they're really the censored ones because of critical race theory bans and, you know, mouse being dropped from this rural Tennessee County's middle school curriculum. And you shouldn't even follow this. You shouldn't even pretend that this is a serious argument. Just laugh at them, say that there is no... That it's far worse what's happening to not even just Joe Rogan, but just like any other person. Like, say, Stefan Molyneux, who we'll talk about later on in the podcast. Like, this guy has been completely disappeared off the Internet just for his political opinions. And there's several other cases. I mean, Nick Fuentes, that's another example of him being banned from every platform and even being put on a no-fly list and having his bank account seized just for his political opinions. And we can go down the list of people. Alex Jones, you know, these are these people who are actually persecuted for their political opinions. And liberals want to pretend that they're still the rebels and, and footloose. And they're like, wow, we're breaking up. We're fighting the man. And the man is actually themselves. And the powers that be that they think they are are just some rural Tennessee county or, you know, ordinary parents wanting their kids not to be taught to hate themselves because they're white. And so conservatives shouldn't even pretend that left-wing concerns about censorship are serious. They're all done in bad faith and all done to shame conservatives and misdirect the conversation in a way that they want while they're busy uh, practicing the <laughs> most outrageous forms of hypocrisy possible. Now moving on to our next uh, censorship subject, and this is the Canadian trucker convoy uh, getting kicked off. GoFundMe, and this is uh, this is an interesting um, thing that happened. I mean, for a, well, for a lot of different reasons. I've highly respected hasn't talked much about the trucker convoy. I don't know. There's like we, I mean, we as in the royal we as in me and my whole team uh, back the trucker convoy. I think it's really cool what they're doing. Uh, it is. It, it's you never would have thought that Canadians would have done a mass form of base civil disobedience. But they're doing it, and it seems to be going pretty well. They are getting concessions from some states. Not the federal government yet, but they are getting concessions from a lot of these other states and our provinces, whatever they call them in Canada. And so it looks to, and it's, you know, great generating a lot of popular support, and it's uh, infuriating all the wrong people, or all the right people, rather. Uh, so all the right are all the um, people who you want to be upset are definitely really outraged by the trucker convoy. Now, this goes to, you know, so obviously with the Canadian government being outraged by this, them seeing this as an act of terrorism to keep honking their horns <laughs> in Ottawa and elsewhere and basically pretending and being very incredibly peaceful and law-abiding, far more so than any Black Lives Matter demonstration that we saw in America, uh, they've been, of course, seen as terrorism and shut down. Or not shut down, but their GoFundMe was shut down. And the GoFundMe raised over $9 million for them. GoFundMe said, well, we talked to law enforcement and they said that there's some uh, not so peaceful activity. So we believe law enforcement, so we're shutting it down. And obviously this is like one of the most well-documented 
uh, events that we can see. We've seen several of the videos and like the not law abiding activity is like, like a few of them yelling at journalists. Uh, one person allegedly carrying a swastika flag, which this, it was not meant to like endorse uh, Nazis. It was apparently a boomerism to show that the other side are Nazis. I think that was, there was also like some Confederate flags, which should be appropriate, but some people are claiming those are Fed activities. And so you haven't really seen any criminal. Uh, any, the only thing is like journalists are being yelled at. It's like, wow, I, I'm, I'm so shocked. But there's been hardly any property damage. I don't think even any property damage. Just peaceful people honking their horns and protesting the government's uh, COVID mandates. But uh, GoFundMe listened to law enforcement for the first time ever and that they, they shut them down. And Initially, they were supposed to give this money away to other. They were going to steal this money and give it away to other charities. So we can only imagine where that money would go to, or like Black Lives Matter Canada or whatever. But there was such a much outcry over it, and all these threats from American governors and Republican senators that they refunded these people. And Republicans are threatening to go after GoFundMe, and there's a couple of state attorney generals that are planning to investigate GoFundMe, which is good. Uh, but, you know, it's it's kind of after the fact that it's also happening in Canada. It's like, why is only America doing this? It's like one of the really disheartening things for Canada is that, you know, they don't really have any represent political representation. It's like the Conservative Party is sort of pro, but they're always condemning them. They're like, we don't really tolerate this type of behavior. And the outrageous behavior, as I said, has been cussing. Also, they, like, decorated these uh statues in ottawa that they have with like canadian uh, with canadian flags and like patriotic stuff and they've been said this is a desecration of our most sacred objects and it's like they're not defacing them they're literally just putting a flagpole in the hand of the statue it's like <laughs> oh no please don't do this and there, and then of course people pulled up evidences of these same statues being decked out in lgbt gear uh to celebrate pride whatever pride month it is or pride weekend i mean there's like you know it's a year-long pride <laughs> month uh now and so it's like they clearly aren't that upset about it. They're just look, trying to find things, uh, grasping at straws and, and looking at reasons to shut down these truckers. There is a lopsided uh, comparison between this and the Black Lives Matter protests. I mean, the other thing about this is that GoFundMe and every major platform essentially gave over all their entire services to Black Lives Matter. In spite of like Black Lives Matter being involved in mass riots and cities being burned and all these stuff and every major tech company essentially allowed black lives matter and other uh racial grift organizations to uh, extort from them during <laughs> during the riots and despite the like over you know two billion dollars worth of damage caused by um i think it might have even been more um might even be a higher price tag than that uh, of damage caused by the Black Lives Matter riots. There's also they found evidence of GoFundMe not only allowing people to support uh, the Capitol Hill occupied or uh, autonomous zone Chaz, which then was turned into CHOP, Capitol Hill autonomy, or, or I forget what the O stood for, but the Capitol, which was in Seattle, which is like Antifa and BLM set up their own zone, which was full of beatings and even some executions <laughs> that happened there. And not only did GoFundMe allow fundraising for it, they promoted the fundraising for it. They had like tweets and fa and Facebook posts like saying like, please give to the Ch to Chaz. Has. Like they're such a great organization of resisting a tyranny. And also the fact of the matter is, is that they're relying on law enforcement to give them this information is that they were funding all this anti-police demonstrations in 2020 and giving, making sure billions of millions of dollars were funneled into these groups. And now they're like, oh, law enforcement is telling us they don't like this. So we're going to listen to them. And it's just like a nature of what Canada is going through. Uh, but it's not deterring the truckers, and I think GoFundMe is having a, a sufficient backlash. But, you know, it does show, like, one thing is, like, the Canada protests may be the most effective COVID protests I've seen so far. Because, you know, it is getting, they are actually getting results, at least in, on the state level and local level. And, you know, we've seen massive protests in Europe, but, you know, 
it didn't deter European governments at all. They would just double down on the mandates and the mass and the lockdowns. I mean, they just didn't give a shit about how large our protests are. But the fact that this is a very strategic protest that it amounts to civil disobedience and using a you know core part of the economy and truckers to do this that everyone loves and yeah it's having the effect but the the type of uh the the coverage of the trucker protests is is hilarious i mean they they really are trying to find like any evil thing it is and as i've talked about i mean other things that they've said besides journalists is that there's this black metal ban panzer faust uh, which pretty good, actually. I just listened to them recently after they heard them. It's a band I've heard of, but I didn't really listen to. And they're not like a fascist band or anything. You know, they're not one of the bands. That, but they came out to support the trucker convoy. And now they're using that as like a reason to attack the the, the truckers. Uh, there's like some people yelling at all the like at random passerbys who come to the trucker convoy and anything. But like, and they're saying that it's like the uh, Ku Klux Klan of... <laughs> of 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 uh canada that's doing this there's this guy who's right drawing these hilarious cartoons one where it's is like the trucks are in kkk hoods and the <laughs> the trucks are carrying tiki torches <laughs> that are exhaust pipes and it's like this is like ah oh, the trucker convoy is in the way there's a one that's really funny that has a, a truck that it, it's like 911 and one and it's like freedom is on the other side and it's like been hit and then like the truck is flying towards the building marked as democracy <laughs> and it's just so funny that's like oh and it's like and the truck has free speech on it it's like free speech is somehow killing democracy which is all part of this like threat to democracy is the fact that you know you can implement these insane rules that you know are are just you know, onerous and, and completely remove people's freedoms, like the ability to move around or live your life is now impeded by governments like mandates, like telling you have to be vaccine boosted and masked at all times. And if you violate these rules, they can arrest you, as we've seen in Australia and elsewhere, or even there's like this new rule, I think in an Australian state, where if you start to disagree or challenge uh, an employee uh, you know, demanding your passport, your Vax passport, or require proper face mask gear, you can now face a year in jail. And all these people are like, and I made the joke is like, this is the type of rules to get you raised on the democracy index or whatever. And it's true, but this is like what they think like democracy is. And democracy is now just means rule by liberal bureaucrats. And the more their rule is respected, the more democratic are. And the more they're disrespected, the less quote unquote democratic you are. And that's really what democracy is. It's now just a euphemism for rule by liberal bureaucrats. So if you follow every dictum that they have and you don't really have free speech, you're not even able to go to your grocery store unless you have a certain id uh, that's democracy but you know if you're if a local state if a state imposes rules on voter id and you know they require voter id now well that's that's anti-democratic as an espn personality on i think it was around the horn that show i'm surprised that show's still on i remember watching it when i was a kid uh, almost 20 years ago <laughs> i think it's i think it was premiered in 2002 or 2003 and one of these idiot sports columnists was like, uh, what's happening in China against, you know, the Uyghurs? It's just as bad as voter ID laws. <laughs> and this is like what most people think. And, you know, even though the government likes to complain about Uyghurs, they also think that, you know, voter ID laws are equal. So that's like anti-democratic, even though it protects elections. And the fact of the matter is you need to ID to drive and to do a whole host of other things. But apparently... You know, and now you need a passport to go to a grocery store or to go to bars, but in certain in many major American cities. But if you even look, if you even think about requiring an ID to vote, that's anti-democratic. So that's what they're using here and um, against the truckers. So when GoFundMe is allowing Black Lives Matter and Chaz and all these other groups to fundraise off them, that was supporting democracy, even though these people were committing violence and and harassing people and even their violence was leading to the deaths of dozens of people that was all for democracy but truckers peacefully protesting in order to 
retrieve their freedoms in order to regain their freedom, that's anti-democratic because it's all based on what liberal bureaucrats believe and not what the people believe. And democracy being whatever liberal bureaucrats decide is also takes place on the world stage. And they do this with, uh, you know, if they ever see a large mass protest of civil disobedience, even with it's getting on to violence or they're trying to overthrow their government and the government, the Western liberal bureaucrats hate, say, like, look, in Ukraine in 2014 during Maidan or in Belarus with uh, Lukashenko uh, or if this happens to Putin. And they're like, this is incredible. We love this. Democracy is overflowing, or what they did with the Arab Spring. But when they see anything that may approach this, and in the trucker convoy is nowhere near the type of like disorder that you saw in Maidan or even the Belarus, uh, Belarusian, uh, Belarusian uh, protest in 2020 and 2021. You know, none of that approaches that. Uh, but then that's like a threat to democracy. So even following things that you see on the world stage, you know, it's. Uh, <laughs> if you try to do that type of stuff here, it's anti-democratic. But if you do that in countries we don't like, uh, like you, Hungary, you, uh, Ukraine, but not in Ukraine anymore. Uh, you, doing that in Ukraine now is anti-democratic. But doing that in Ukraine and uh, pre-Maidan or during Maidan was pro-democratic. Or in Belarus or in Russia or, you know, Iran or elsewhere, you know, that's pro-democracy. But if you try to do that in their own countries against their suppression of freedom, that is anti-democratic. So that's the standard that they like to use at all times. So, if you know, and I pointed this out on Twitter, if the GoFundMe thing had happened in Russia or in Hungary or in Belarus, every single person who would be who's celebrating it would be condemning it and saying this is an affront to democracy and freedom. But if it happens here, it's uh, supporting democracy and freedom. Now onto our final case of cancel culture and censorship. I guess this will be a good summary for it, maybe. What the example is that uh, The View co-host uh, Whoopi Goldberg had an interesting insight last week about the... Um, when she, they were talking... For some reason, though, well, actually not for some reason. The View was talking about the mouse... Uh, I'm not even going to call it a book ban, but the mouse controversy in McMahon County, Tennessee. And they're discussing the Holocaust. And Whoopi Goldberg decided to say it wasn't about race. And uh, the rest of the co-hosts were like, what? <laughs> and they got really flustered by that. It's like, what? The no, 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 it's about race. And it's like they hated Jews and gypsies. And this, and they're like saying that, you know, the Nazis were motivated by race. It's like, no, these were, Whoopi Goldberg is like, no, these were two groups of white people. And then she said, the real thing is about man's inhumanity to man. And of course, I'm paraphrasing here. And this is, this, of course, uh, led to a mass form of controversy. Uh, people saying because uh, people had a tough time saying why they were upset about this because it was more that she just sounded like well, it's like that's a bizarre way of talking about it like Holocaust you have if you're ever going to talk about it you know there's a there's set rules <laughs> in discussing the topic and going outside of it anytime that somebody hears something uh, different from that they automatically pause and like what uh, but the ADL and other people were cr criticizing her. And she eventually just had to apologize and say, like, I was mistaken, you know, it was about race. But when she even went on Col Stephen Colbert's show, she still insisted, like, well, you know, that's a little bit a, a side distraction. Like, it's man's inhumanity to man. And no, it really, the main point of this ordeal, she got suspended for two weeks over it. Uh, that became, you know, people were like, I can't, I can't believe that. Apparently the other view hosts are upset about it. Um, so there's a lot to discuss from this topic of Whoopi Goldberg. I mean, the first thing you talk about is the parameters of discussing, you know, the Holocaust and topics dealing with World War II and what is allowed discourse or what is the proper form of mandated discourse that's allowed to talk or you're allowed to discuss about it. Second City Bureaucrat, I said that there would be a second reference to our favorite Chicago uh, bureaucrat. He had a great article on American Greatness about it. It just came out today. So if you guys want to go over there and check it out, second, just type in Second City Bureaucrat American Greatness. And I retweeted it so you can try to find it th th through there. He basically said that the Goldberg situation represents a 
diminishment of the old American civil religion. And the old American civil religion said that there are so many differences between us that we have to find shared commonalities to look into these experiences. And he would say that, you know, the old American civil religion, the reason why the Holocaust was important is that it illustrated man's inhumanity to man. And that's what Goldberg was citing, not just as racial conflict that is the more popular interpretation today. And that's generally what people were always saying is that if you looked at, you know, when Hol the Holocaust was like seen as this like paramount event and it first came out, it was like the 80s and 90s, I think especially with the release of Schindler's List, it was treated as like, you know, this really illustrates how man's inhumanity to man. And this is like the lesson that we should all learn. And this is why they said that like all kids need to learn this. So they never do this mistake. And that, you know, if you have absolute power, you don't try to oppress people. And that's why they would be assigning books like Mouse and, and Diary of Anne Frank and Knight and all these things to illustrate this, uh, you know, universal lesson that could, you know, all Americans could gravitate towards. Bureaucrat was arguing that the new interpretation is that it's something unique to the Jewish people and a unique offense to to Jews, which is not, you know, something radically new is that they've been arguing this for many time. And that Whoopi Goldberg's violation was diminishing that um, that unique uh, suffering and atrocity that only the Jewish people had and during the Holocaust. And that's what Bureaucrat argues is the real violation is that. You know, and what we're really coming at, he doesn't necessarily spell this out, maybe because he knew his audience, but it's, um, you know, there are now these competing ethnic grievances by different groups of people. And there's no there's no longer a, an attempt to universalize it to show like, why should somebody care about this? But now it's seen as bad because it happened to these specific people and these specific people have. Uh, that's what gives a greater moral clout, which makes it, you know, a little bit harder to understand, like, why you're learning about this particular topic. If it's not trying to illustrate a universal human uh, theme, and that's what the problem with Goldberg's thing happened, is that that was an affront to it. Well, there's a little bit more to that. I, I really like the article. You guys should read it. It goes, it's very uh, high IQ. It's it's definitely will increase your IQ, <laughs> IQ points a bit by reading it. Lots of big words and uh, big uh, advanced terminology used and, and writers cited by it. So I, I encourage people to read it. But there is a little bit more going on here. Uh, with Goldberg, I think, you know, people are, there are some on our side, I saw some people like Disney Ranger just making this is that there's a privilege pyramid and like at the top, you know, people are trying to claim the Jews are at the top, not anybody else. And there is even I th somebody shared is actually our good friend. Ak Bolga, who actually got banned. It's uh, Hul. He used to go by Hul. He went by a different name. I forget the name now. I can't even look up the name because he got banned just this week. He shared a post of Keith Woods. Uh, he didn't attack uh, Ak, Ak Bolga by name, but Keith Woods was going on about how you know, people claim that America is a black ethno state, but look at what they did to this black woman who dared talk about the Jews. It's like, that's totally false. And it's like, they're claiming the Jews are at the top of the privilege pyramid. And you may say that, like, they'll also point out Nick Cannon. Nick Cannon got in trouble for making, well, he made these really horrible anti-white comments, but he also included some anti-Semitic comments. And that's what, the anti-white comments didn't get him in trouble, but the anti-Semitic comments did. And he had to go, like, do this whole, like, field trips and stuff to educate himself. And he got, I think one of his platforms dropped him. But then he got perfect rehabilitated in less than a year, and now he's back to normal. So there was really no harm, no foul to uh, Nick Cannon over time. And it's the same with Whoopi Goldberg. It's like a two-week suspension, and then she'll move on. There will be no lasting effect to Whoopi Goldberg. And I think of the same way as, like, you know, the – you know, Woods and others were attacking this notion as like America's a black ethnic state. Now, now imagine if like a Jew, a Jewish person said, you know, something like slavery wasn't that bad. And they had a large TV host, like say it's like an ESPN host or whatever. And they said that that person would be immediately fired <laughs> and there would be no chance of rehabilitation for that person. It's like and it doesn't matter whether the Jewish, Asian or white is like saying these types of things. Uh, gets them in trouble. Or even if people criticize Black Lives Matter is what happened with this Asian woman who is a star of 
uh, the de- the real housewives of Salt Lake City. I didn't know that they've made it to Salt Lake City yet with a real housewives show, but this woman on her own private Facebook account shared memes attacking Black Lives Matter. And that got her fired from the show. It's like you cannot criticize Black Lives Matter if you're going to be an entertainer. So it does show that like people are trying to say that like oh they're putting down and like some people are even suggesting arguments that oh we need to work together with them against the real threat. And I was like no that's not what's happening here. And even what Whoopi Goldberg's interpretation of this is is there was her appeal to man's inhumanity to man and trying to universal concept, which like Bureaucrat was defending her on that notion. But there is something else that Bureaucrat didn't take into full account that she said that I think is going to be more common is that saying, oh, well, Germans and Jews, these are just two groups of white people. And that is a very illustrative moment because that's what a lot of, I think, POC are going to start seeing this as, is that as America's demographics change, And everyone has to read like Mouse or Knight or whatever. And they're going to be like, but wait a minute, this doesn't uphold my ethnic grievances. This isn't about my ethnic grievances. And even with like the ADL's new line and ADL even kept changing their notion of racism to this, like somebody found their new definition of racism was basically only white people could be racist. And then they changed it to something about power and to broaden it in order to uh, ensure that like the Nazis were definitely included under this definition or, or what Whoopi Goldberg was saying about them. But when they read this stuff, they're going to be like, but I want to work. I want society to focus on my grievances. And we're even seeing this now with uh, like the 1619 project and others. And bureaucrat mentioned this is like these ethno narcissism, but it's competing grievances. And, you know, if you're reading this book in class and it's like, you know, all non-whites and they're of course not blamed for it even though uh they would sometimes you know try to do the blame game for the holocaust against white americans which makes no sense i mean we didn't we were not we ended it or we helped end it um but when it comes to this if they're teaching that in class and they're trying to teach a lesson to this you know the non-whites are going to be like well you know, I want to learn about slavery. I want to learn about colonialism because this is the bad thing that happened to my ancestors. And I want to learn about this in order to make the white kids feel bad. And so that they have a personal debt to me uh, instead of this uh, event that happened in Europe that really doesn't involve anybody here in the classroom. And I think that this is definitely, this is like two groups of white people. And I think that's going to be a much more common thing. You've already seen some of that. And I think the Holocaust is being replaced by slavery and colonialism and what they're teaching in class. It's getting replaced by 1619 Project and Ibram X. Kendi and stuff. And it's and that stuff focuses on much more American events. And even with the anti-colonial movement, it's focusing on the entire history of Western civilization and not just this one event that occurred in the mid-20th century. And so they're wanting to broaden it broaden it in order that their grievances are upheld and are what is taught and is what the main lesson driven to these kids. So if like all these uh, South Asians are coming in and they want to learn about the terrible things that the British did to them under colonialism, they want that taught in order so they can have like this thing, this grievance to make against white Americans, even though white Americans weren't involved in that. And it's the same with blacks when they want slavery and segregation and redlining and uh, p- white people touching their hair, you know, all their type of grievances. They want that taught so they can have like the moral advantage and moral superiority over whites. And it and it satisfies their eth- ethnic grievances and furthers their demands, which the Holocaust does not do that for that. So that is one thing is that well, Goldberg wasn't necessarily dismissing the Holocaust, even though some people saw that, and especially with her comment of two groups of white people, which is now we're trained to think that, oh, that's not so bad. It's like, oh, it's like, well, it's just two groups of white people killing each other. Why should we care? Which Goldberg didn't necessarily say that wasn't necessarily her meaning, but that was an implication of that. And I think that is going to be an implication that others are going to be make much more explicit and spell out over time. And it's even with this, what happens with German atrocities towards Slavs. I mean, they're, they killed a lot of Slavic. It's not a laughing matter. And they killed a ton of Slavs. I mean, Poles, Ukrainians, Russians, uh, you know, no, you name it. They killed a ton and they were and they had a plan to turn them into serfs, essentially enslaving them. 
But that's like story is not <laughs> really heard because it's a send like, well, you know, in some ways because, oh, it's two groups of white people. And I guess with Jews, you know, they're for most time they've been seen as something different. But now under the new standard set by, uh, you know, 1619 Project and others, and essentially with the ascension of POC and with the decline of the old elite, Oh, and with a new elite that's much more uh, immigrant, uh, you know, much more Asian, I think is that there's they're not willing to give like the separate carve out to Jews as something different from white as they're just nor they're just whites, just like every other white person. And there's been a lot of complaints if you ever read this stuff, especially in Barry Weiss's uh, Substack. She always points out she'll like interview these Jewish parents in New York City and stuff. And they're like really irate that their kids are being taught that like you're you're responsible for slavery. You're evil because you're white. And they're like, well, uh, we're Jewish. We didn't think of ourselves as, as necessarily white. And they're telling us we're terrible, these terrible things. And the understanding point is they're being lumped in with whites. And there's no special exception made for them. And I think this is going to be more, far more common over time. So when it comes to, you know, the privilege pyramid or something with that, I mean, they might be get too focused on that. But I think if Whoopi Goldberg or somebody makes those comments in five years or 10 years, I don't think that person will be punished because the... The only there will have to be a lesson about how evil whites are racist, like this is a sign of white racism or white supremacy and how we need to counteract that. And it'll be tied to America's history and America's culture and what American society is like. It's going to be made much more explicit. But the argument that these are just two groups of white people, you know, doing that and, uh, you know, in a dis dismissive manner. I think in five to 10 years, that's not going to result in any type of punishment or in any type near type of controversy because we're moving towards a 1619 project where 1619 project is replacing Knight and the Diary of Anne Frank as the new stuff that people, kids need to read in order to feel bad about themselves. And it's much more direct to the American experience and it's a much more of a you know, pointing the finger at a specific group of people in America to feel guilty at while upholding another group of people as morally superior because they're the victims of the story. And that works much better with 1619 Project and anti-colonialist narratives than it does with the Holocaust. So that's my point on it. And I think, you know, that is illustrative of it. So I do, th I do agree with uh, Bureaucrat's point, but I also think that that, um, I guess uh, the critical race theory aspect of that. I don't even really like the term critical race theory I like too much. I mean, it, like what it is, but that's the new catch all for this type of thinking. Um, you know, that's going to have a definite impact on how the Holocaust is interpreted for the future. Now, I might have said the last segment was the last one before we got to the cognitive elite question, but I lied or I was wrong because there's actually there's so many more that happened in just one week that I had to cover this one. And this is a highly respected guest and a highly respected ally, I guess, or associate or trusted person with a high IQ. Uh, Michelle Malk had actually experienced another gross form of censorship or cancel culture last week is that Airbnb announced or didn't announce, but told her that her and her husband are now banned from the platform because of her political views, which is just ridiculous because you could theoretically argue some people have said this about like Twitter or Facebook. They could say, well, it's be your behavior that's happened on that platform or your views. And this is just a, a forum for sharing your views. And we find them objectionable or whatever. So we're kicking you off. We, of course, pose that. But we can understand where they're coming from. That makes no sense for Airbnb, which is operating a, a, as a hospitality platform, to ban somebody for their political views when that has no impact over on them being a guest or a host on on their platform you know i don't think it's like being america first does not impact your ability to be a good hotel guest but the airbnb is one of the worst offenders of this of censorship and it's not it's not it's really gone unnoticed is that i've known a ton of people who have been banned from airbnb uh for no reason at all <laughs> or just because their political views and they're private individuals and they just get reported to them i remember one time that uh, I think I don't know I've, is that when Lauren Southern when she was during her uh, brief uh, retirement phase she was like banned from Airbnb 
And you're just like, for what? <laughs> it's like for being dangerous and right wing person. And now they're doing this to Michelle Malkin, who's, you know, a relatively well known, conser- who's a pretty well known conservative, who's like, you know, not saying, doing anything objectionable. She's not committing terrorist attacks. She's not doing anything uh, nuts or illegal. And they simply ban her. And not only her, but her husband. Her husband's done no wrong. Her husband is the fault. The reason why he can't be on Airbnb is that for the crime of being married to Michelle Malkin. And, you know, that's outrageous. And that's like in the land of the free that this is happening. And that's like what truly cancel culture is, is the fact is they want to claim that, um, you know, the banning of this book, of the mouse book or whatever is the real act of cancel culture is that, and they always make this joke like left wing cancel culture is out of control whenever there's like some minor thing that the right does to push back against the, <laughs> against liberalism. But, you know, the impact that happens to the right is that you can no longer live your life as a normal person. Like if you can, if you're not allowed at like hotels or Airbnb, how can you travel? You know, it's like even I know even some people are banned from Uber just for their political beliefs. And this is like the state of America is in and all these people who want to pretend that they're still the rebels against the man against fighting against mouse and they literally face no amount of censorship or no pushback. And even when they commit actual crimes is what we saw with Black Lives Matter and Antifa protesters. They get no criminal sentence handed down. But if you had the audacity to walk around the Capitol without permission, you get over three years in jail. And now if you have the audacity to stand up for American first ideas and values, you can be banned from hotels, be banned from Airbnb, be not necessarily be banned from hotels because those are the different rules guiding it. But be banned from Airbnb, be banned from Air, from Uber, get kicked off your bank account or even have your bank account seized by the government. Get put on no fly list, like get banned from Twitter, YouTube, uh, uh, you name it. And all these people want to just sit there and liberals want to sit there and like cry over mouse getting removed from the curriculum. They want to just say, oh, these are private entities. They can do whatever they want. And, you know, that's uh, that's the real cancel culture here. And unlike what some conservatives are trying to claim in the wake of the Joe Rogan incident, it is not subsiding. It is still stronger than ever. That is it for the non-cognitive elite questions and non-cognitive elite portion of this podcast. We're now moving on to the cognitive elite portion of this podcast, and this is a really good question, and I've got to read it at full. But as a reminder, you too can get the power to suggest guests and questions if you sign up for the cognitive elite option at highly respected Substack, and that's at highly respected dot substack.com and you should of course sign up for highly respected substack to get all the iq supplements so you can be as big brained as me and as our most loyal listeners so now time for the question this one comes from jb and i'm going to read it in full so bear with me a bit he says i've heard some people on the distant and right say that censorship in 2021 starting with trump on twitter has been an overwhelming benefit to the distant and right their reasons One, Trump would dominate right-wing discourse when he was on Twitter and would make it difficult for dissident right talking points to become the focus. Two, gatekeeper right-wing accounts never recover from the censorship, but dissident right audiences followed influencers to other platforms. And uh, Stefan Molyneux never recovered, for example. And that's what I said the second reference to Stefan Molyneux would come. There are evidence for the success. One, mainstream right has adopted almost all the dissident right talking points at this point. My question, do you subscribe to this thinking? And, he, you know, he asks, is like, uh, also is like, whatever your opinion on alt tech, you know, it's provided the ability for dissident right groups to regroup after being censored. And I have always been a, you know, I support that. And I'm not necessarily a... Uh, opponent. That's one reason why I like, you know, alt tech is it does give us the ability to regroup and talk to amongst ourselves, but it does not give us the ability to influence the public square like we did before. So that's a, that's a thought that I would just give to that to his final, but has censorship helped the dissident right? As he says, do, does he think, I, I don't know, really know these reasons. I don't know if I've seen this before, but I assume it's happened. Maybe it's been, people have been saying this on Gab on Telegram. Uh, in some ways, it's a cope. <laughs> um, I do agree with his point that like this and a right talking points are now much more mainstream. But I don't know 
it, the way that it's being censored, I, censorship has played a role in it, but not in a way that I think the people making these arguments would like. Is that the all rights de discrediting itself and being shunted aside and no longer being in the public square has made it more acceptable for people who are on more mainstream right to adopt these views is that they no longer have to worry about getting associated with Richard Spencer and Charlottesville by saying these things. And, you know, it's also not necessarily, that's one factor, but that's a small factor. I don't know if that's like a really major factor. The really big factors are is that Trump and Tucker Carlson have such a major influence over the right now is that they're introducing all these new ideas and new concepts to people and making people, pushing people in a direction, a much more nationalist direction that has made more of the mainstream right talk, discuss these talking points. I mean, I know I always say this, like five or six years ago, no one talked about anti-white racism. Now that's what Republican candidates are running on and winning on. And all these news media outlets are talking about that. I mean, that's what helped Glenn Youngkin win in 2021 in Virginia. And he's even going hard on that as a governor, or fairly hard on that as governor. And other Republicans are planning to run on that in 2022. Uh, great replacement was not talked about at all. Now that's like a mainstream topic and like, you know, Republican uh, lawmakers are willing to talk about uh, demographic change. And it's something that they weren't willing to discuss before. Uh, immigration restriction, you know, bef prior to Trump, all Republicans would just talk about is illegal immigration while talking about how much they love legal immigration. Now tons of candidates are talking about limiting legal immigration. And so, and even when it comes to economics and government power, now people are willing to talk about using government power to end tech censorship and other things. I think that's one way that some people are, you know, misdirecting a lot of energy on and talking about uh, censorship or not necessarily censorship, but talking about like using state power for the common good. And that's like misdirecting a lot of what the nationalist energy uh, that animated Trump in 2016 and in 2020. And it's not necessarily these people are getting upset about people not using state power to um, curb DoorDash or Uber, you know, it's much more. And really what we're concerned with is like using state power to crush uh, Twitter censorship and Facebook censorship. And But now people are much more willing to accept that government intervening to do things to punish uh, corporations that act wrongly or act out of our uh, against conservative interests. And that was an idea that wouldn't have been entertained pre-Trump. So all this is like change. I don't think it's necessarily a result of censorship. I think censorship, uh, there is a kind of a benefit to censorship. But this is, you know, the, I would admit this is kind of a cope is that it makes the right more sophisticated and sharper with our arguments and our type of rhetoric that we're using is that when we realize we have these rules to abide by, we don't go full on crazy. And I've said this like, you know, uh, I'm a big fan of Gab, but I love Gab. I've been on Gab. I'm not, this is not a criticism of Gab, this, but this is kind of a, a criticism of some of the people on Gab is that you'll go on Gab and uh, people, you know, just let their freak flag fly high and they'll just be using racial slurs and like all this type of rhetoric that's like deeply unappealing to normal people. And like if people are just seeing this as like their only interaction with the dissident right, they're gonna be like, I don't want any part of this. But a lot of the censorship it acts as a moderate and sometimes acts as a moderating force on us and realizing what we have to say. But uh, the one problem with that is that censorship is so arbitrary that it can happen at any moment. Like you can be following all the rules and be saying like whatever way Twitter expects you to say and you could get still get censored. And that happened with Stefan Molyneux. I don't think Molyneux really uh, was violating the rules of Twitter or YouTube that much and he still got censored. And it could be said for many other people are normally conservatives is that it's so arbitrary that you don't know what rules to follow. But I think if they set, you know, it does. I think in a lot of ways it has. But due to reacting to censorship and realizing like and how we have to interact with people is that it has sharpened the rhetoric or made it more sophisticated and less um, obnoxious over time. Uh, that that in some ways this is a cope um, and even with the like some some of the things is like 
uh, I don't and I don't necessarily agree with the Trump discourse. It's like Trump being off Twitter has I think it's an I would say it's ultimately a negative. I mean, the fact that like big tech can censor the president of the United States and get away with it is not a good thing under any circumstance. And I think it's us trying to find the the bright side of a negative event uh, rather than addressing the reality of it. I mean, yeah. And also, I think like Trump would be totally like furthering dissident right talking points if he's still on Twitter, as he would not be like talking about like lowest black unemployment (laughs) or stuff. He would be going full bore with the type of rhetoric he sees. And you can see this at his rallies. I mean, his rallies, he's talking about anti-white racism now. He's talking about um, these racist district attorneys who are out for against white people. He's talking about immigration. You know, he's talking about, uh, you know, evils of immigration and the Haitians and all these other things. And these are this type of rhetoric he's getting at. And you can see this in his press statements and at his rallies. And they're much better than, you know, when he was president. You know, it's returned to form in many ways for him. Uh, to his 2016 form with these statements that we're seeing. So I think if he was on Twitter, I think it'd be uh, furthering the discourse. I don't think it would be uh, misdirecting it or, or, or taking away the focus. I think he would be honing in on these subjects and he would just like have an offensive tweet that, you know, it could be saying something about critical race theory that would totally shape the discourse for months at end. I think a lot of the populist think types like to say this because they think that he's made... Uh, they're talking points disreputable and they like, oh, you know, I would win over these uh, white liberal suburban moms if it wasn't for Trump. And so they say that, but I don't really agree with that with our standpoint. So I understand there are some, you know, it's not total downside from the censorship. I mean, there is a way that you can have some cope posts about it. But ultimately, it is negative and we have to solve it because this censorship can only get worse. And I think, you know, people want to say it's like, well, people travel along with their crowds. And that's true. I mean, people have been censored before and they still maintain a large audience. I mean, Nick Fuentes is an example of that. Uh, Alex Jones is an example of that. And they're still able to have influence. But I mean, those are some of the exceptions. I mean, some people, if they get, you know, kicked off one platform, you know, it's like Stefan Molyneux or... um, You know, with Milo uh, Milo over time, even though Milo still manages to have some influence, um, there is also Bill Mitchell is another example of somebody who's like people totally forget about now that he's off the major platform. So this is an example of that. I don't think necessarily censorship has been a good thing. It is something that we have to resolve. Um, There are some uh, upsides to it. I don't know if those are addressed in those talking points uh, with it. I mean, it is true or the dissident rights. Uh, arguments are now more prevalent in political discourse, but I don't think that's necessarily a real, or that I don't see that as a large part due to censorship. I think it's uh, more of an accidental thing that the fact that they've shunned it aside the people that no one wanted to associate with, and they're not no one has to worry about getting associated with them anymore. So now they're willing to say these ideas out in public. So that's my opinion on that. Uh, I think that was a really good question. Uh, otherwise. Um, it is something that we have to consider, and we're always liable to get censored. I mean, this podcast you're listening to this on YouTube, it could be one day shut down. As we're seeing with what if if they can go after Joe Rogan, if they can shut down Joe Rogan, they can of course go after all of us. And so that's one thing to keep in mind with all the censorship and cancel culture. And with concluding thoughts on cancel culture, it is not in retreat. Wokeness is not in retreat. It's in many ways getting stronger, but we're gonna have to fight even harder against it in order to have freedom and live in the type of country we want that has actual freedom, not the type of freedom that liberal bureaucrats imagine for us that requires us to be masked at all times and showing our Vax passport just to go to the grocery store. So those are my concluding thoughts today. Make sure you like and subscribe to the YouTube channel and sign up for IQ supplements at highlyrespected.substack.com. So until next time, stay respected.